to present the, the session. The session is part of a series of presentations made around the, the 20th anniversary of MS. Famous. So uh, I think it's the third presentation tonight, today, and um, and there is a presentation every month. Um, the idea is to present the work made around the image and the research and the books that uh, show the, the diversity of themes and topics of MS work and research. Uh, this event is being recorded right now, so uh, as uh, it will be recorded in the MS YouTube channel. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn off your microphone and your cameras. So my name is uh, Philippe Henault, and we are six today to present a book. Uh, we are the six editors, actually. Uh, that will be uh, That will be uh, Lucian Dos Santos, uh, Lars Ulgard, Linda will not be there, but Swati Banerjee is there, Flo Avedino, and Jean Louis Laville. We will keep in this order to make the presentation to show the diversity uh, on, uh, of this book. This book is named Theory of Social Enterprise and Pluralism Social Movement, Solidarity, Economy, and Global South. Uh, it's a it's a book made with six editors, uh, with 15 authors, and uh, 10 countries are represented in the book. And the idea of this book was to uh, deepen the theoretical and critical debate about social enterprise. Uh, I think that it's a major concern today about the sustainability of our economic development uh, on two. Uh, two issues. On one hand, uh, ecological uh, and sustainability, the climate change, the trace of biodiversity. And on the other hand, on the, other end, uh, the idea that this economy is uh, entailing a lot of inequalities and uh, the both and sustainability, the social one and ecological one are intertwined. And, uh, are challenging us. Um, there, therefore, we need to find a way to open uh, necessary uh, social and, and ecological concern and to concentrate on the way to uh, to make the transition, social and ecological transition that we need. Uh, inside the uh, social enterprise literature, we, we think that is a, a, a nice opportunity to work on these uh, questions. And uh, the, the, the idea of the book started with the idea that social enterprise were more uh, uh, approach upon one issue, one exception, social business. And the idea of this book is to open different perspectives, conceptual, and uh, from a conceptual and theoretical perspective. Uh, so the book made the uh, assumption that there is mainly two ways of dealing uh, with the concept of social economy. The first one is uh, linked with the idea that social enterprise is a matter of economy, matter of social, and the balance between both and uh, that social enterprise, social enterprise is some kind of answer to social challenges according to entrepreneurial uh, feasibility. So uh, the literature then is social business. It, uh, the concept is also the third sector. It's uh, the, the, this first perspective is focused on the idea that should be a managerial response for uh, companies. Uh, to uh, address social issues. Mainly this concept is, is, um, is, is, per, is, um, is born in the United States of America. Uh, another concept more to Europe and the world is the uh, concept of social economy, social enterprise and social economy. The idea there is to combine 
association of person with activity, economic activity. And uh, it's not a matter only of economy and social and balance between both. It's also a question of governance, participative governance, democratic governance. Can you close your microphone? Can you do? I'm trying, but I need to find out who is because there are 30 people. Yeah. Roger is there. Roger. Oh, yeah. If you could shut off your microphones, please. Thank you. So the, the, the book uh, work on the third and uh, last uh, perspective, the solidarity economy as a conceptual perspective. Uh, in such a perspective, social enterprise can enable protection and emancipation through deliberation and uh, uh, intermediary public spaces. So uh, this time it's not only uh, about economy and social, but also political dim dimension. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the conceptual framework can open uh, on political issues uh, such as gender, racism, colonialism, inequalities, class and power relations, climate change, ecological transition, and so on. Uh, so the idea that the social enterprise, enterprise is no more uh, approach through only organizational uh, perspective, but also political ones that enable uh, the social enterprise to interact with the, with the social, institutional, and political context. Uh, we we opened the book to the question of North and South, and we uh, adopt a new uh, epistemology, uh, epistemology of the South, uh, in order to uh, uh, make that this concept of of uh, North-South dialogue can open in a new uh, epistemology uh, basis. Uh, This is part of my introduction. So now I will open the floor to my co-editors. And first I will ask uh, Lucian to, to take the floor. Lucian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Philippe. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank this invitation to participate in this session. Uh, I'm very glad to see so many friends here and I, and I would like to, to mention Yoshi, Noriko. I have not been with them for a long time. And I would like to add that it's a very, it's a great pleasure to be with friends whom I had the opportunity to write with Jean-Louis, Philippe, Swati, and so many friends that are here today. Flora Velino. Well, uh, I would like to, to emphasize three or four points uh, about something that Philippe uh, mentioned, which is the possibility of uh, bringing to the scene aspects such as colonialism, uh, gender issues, and uh, epistemologies of the South, other theoretical perspectives to think of social enterprises. Uh, I, I would like to, to start by saying that it's not common uh, for social enterprise, third sector, social economy, and even solidarity economy to have uh, a moment of dialogue with post-colonial framework or uh, epistemologies of the South. It's a very new approach. So this is this book uh, gives us the opportunity to to see the matching between solidarity economy or community economies, if we prefer, and post-colonial approach. And here we have emphasized the epistemologies of the South. 
Regarding the, the chapter uh, Swati Banerji and I uh, wrote, which is the, 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 the first chapter, I would like to, to start by um, focusing on a, on a concept that is central, pivotal to our discussion in the book. It is the concept of economic coloniality. Uh, economic coloniality, uh, which is a concept, uh, a concept uh, thought by by Walter Mignolo and uh, and Quijano. Uh, but here, I would like to 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 propose a different concept of economic coloniality uh, going a bit further. Economic coloniality for us here can be understood as a naturalized pattern of power, which particularly affects the social imagery and the material life of subaltern groups, whether they be in the South or in the South of the North, making them believe in a supposedly universal evolutionary parameter of development. According to this measure, used to compare the performance of individual social groups, economies, or translocal communities, some groups should be viewed as progressive and others as backward. As demonstrated by Zayel Abdi and Sharushila, both in the field of economics and feminist economics particularly, this ruler has been built from a particular narrative of development and used to justify the idea of an ontological precedence of Western societies. And here uh, plays a pivotal role the epistemologies of the South, proposed by Boaventura de Souza Santos. Uh, epistemologists of the South has also questioned this precedence. They have challenged some assumptions taken as universal by Western knowledges and pointed out that the South as a sociological category can also be found in the North, meaning that abyssal exclusions take also place in the West. In fact, the denial of remaining wounds Colonial wounds has led the West to misinterpret abyssal exclusions, assuming them as a question of refining social regulation. Treated as non-abyssal, the abyssal exclusions cannot be solved through an agenda of development, since the roots have an ontological nature, that is, the underlying assumption that there is a prior backwardness associated with the otherness rather than structural conditions that have continuously disadvantaged these groups. Dismantling this ontological trap and the way it leaves an imprint in policies and development strategies for minorities is a key factor towards economic justice. And this is a key point in this chapter to think of social enterprises from a different perspective, challenging the imagery uh, towards development, towards uh, technical solutions and so on. So this is the point. How can we stimulate other ways of thinking of social enterprises in such a way that community knowledges can be effectively validated, agency can replace the very idea of empowering an economic democracy can go beyond the concept of social inclusion. And I, I clarify here, social inclusion might also be a trapped concept in the sense that it can be thought and it happens so often as something given from someone else, from outside. Explain, explaining better, this chapter is concerned with three questions I'd say. Uh, the first one is why to decolonize? The second is what to decolonize? And the third is how to decolonize? Uh, the first question, why to decolonize? I think that uh, I, 
I said some words about uh, our chapter. I mean, uh, Swatiba Energies and, and mine. And I'd say that it's because we should question these underlying ideas uh, that the West has the answers to different contexts regarding development, life quality, democracy, even agency. Why are non-Western solutions usually understood as local and specific responses not suitable for us, whereas Western solutions are assumed as deliverable for everyone everywhere? Sustainable societies in their broadest sense, will require from us to be open to different paradigms, as well as to solutions that are likely to challenge the larger scale responses on, on the way we think of success or the way we think of successful initiatives. And large scale is a very, has been a very important uh, issue when we have uh, addressed the social enterprise, uh, social entrepreneurship and other uh, ideas related to. Not rarely taking the pulse of communities uh, to understand what makes sense for them could be more reliable. Not rarely taking the pulse, uh, sorry, taking the pulse of communities to understand what makes sense for them could be more reliable in terms of achieving long-term results rather than engaging them in outside model solutions. It leads us to the following message. Economic democracy, and which is a, a very pivotal concept in this chapter, and I'd say uh, in all the book, economic democracy cannot exist in the absence of autonomy and power of choice. What to decolonize, and I'm uh, finishing my, my, my speech, my, my uh, message, what to decolonize? Uh, I'd say that we should decolonize the way we have addressed, evaluated, and communicated with the communities we assisted, particularly the minority ones, the Black communities, the Homa communities, the immigrant communities, uh, the South in the North. Our excess of confidence in technical solutions is another issue we should have taken into account. The underrepresentation of subaltern communities and groups, the very idea we have had about participation and the political dimension, and how to decolonize to end up validating other knowledges and context-based context -based solutions, challenging the androcentric perspective of the economy and the public sphere, considering that people are capable of agency and in having that of resilience, challenging what we have assumed as innovation and being opened to the idea of popular technologies that sometimes we can uh, despise Understanding that economic democracy requires an intersectional lens to comprehend how previous inequalities and asymmetries, some of them symbolic ones, might forfeit the material life of some groups. And this is the, 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 the most important message, I think, the, the idea of comprehending uh, through intersectional lenses, the way that asymmetries are uh, together, uh, deepening the condition, the 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 social the the inequality condition of some groups, and sometimes we might ignore this and think that we are for we are uh, addressing solutions. Uh, through a technological perspective. So this idea of bringing colonialism, post-colonialism uh, to the scene is to invite us all to think differently through uh, differently uh, about what we consider as knowledge, what we consider as solution, what we consider as agency, 
and what we considered first and foremost as economic democracy. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucian. Now, if you, if you agree, we keep the, the, the debate a question afterwards, after the presentations, but you can do, use the chat space to make any comments you want. And then I give the floor to, to Lars. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. And uh, thank you, Lucian. And um, uh, thank you to Swadi and Lucian. I think uh, with your uh, chapter, uh, you ask uh, the most Im important question that, that, that we can ask uh, still, uh, social enterprise, is it possible to decolonize this, uh, this concept? Uh, if you if you are only uh, to read one of the chapters in in this book, uh, I suggest uh, you I suggest you really read this first chapter. It is it is really a wonderful chapter. I've used it with with students uh, these last uh, four or five years. Uh, since this event is also a part of the <clears throat> Emis anniversary, uh, it is it is a time also to to reflect a bit on uh, the evolution and institutionalization of social enterprise throughout uh, these uh, last decades. You know, when we met uh, the, uh, the, this group of sociologists, economists, organizational theorists, political scientists uh, 25 to 30 years ago, uh, not 20 years ago, 25, 27 years ago, uh, we had all, from our different vantage points, in different national contexts in Europe, different faculties, we'd seen something new that we couldn't understand. Uh, I myself was, uh, I'm a sociologist. I was a welfare state analyst and a social policy, social work analyst. I also worked a lot on civil society. There was something new going on. It was as if uh, critical civil society leaders, they thought that we cannot continue just advocacy and critical agenda set setting and empowerment without also uh, getting engaged in some entrepreneurial economic activities. So starting to form local community-based, solidarity-based economic activities, that was what we saw, uh, some, some of our colleagues who had worked on cooperatives, they also saw something new happening in, in the cooperative sector. Um, a, a kind of new, new type of uh, social, social economy. Uh, we, we didn't exactly know how to, how to label this, but I think we understood it. And our interest, cor correct me if I'm wrong, Jean-Louis, later, uh, was that it was some kind of non-capitalist, uh, non-capitalist uh, endeavor. That's what we saw. Building, really uh, taking uh, 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 egalitarian solidarity serious, taking empowerment of local communities and citizens serious, uh, and, 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 and uh, to understand these new entrepreneurial uh, uh, entities. So, is it then possible to decolonize this this period? What has happened? I'm, I'm, I, I fear that um, I fear that it is very difficult. Actually, uh, I think that these last couple of decades has shown that um, the main interest, the main policy interest, even the main interest of, among uh, civil society leaders adopting the social enterprise agenda, is uh, kind of replicating the functionings and the workings of conventional enterprises using the vocabulary, the thinking about professionalization of boards, thinking about the way uh, services and goods are produced in similar ways as in the capitalist uh, enterprise. So when, when we started out observing this, actually many of our ideas were similar to, to, to those uh, Swati and, and uh, Luciane race and also that, that Luciane talked about. But we have had too much focus uh, in, in the social enterprise, even in EMIS, uh, even in, 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 um, in, our, in our 
a lot of our work, we have had probably too much focus on organizational characteristics of social enterprises and too little <clears throat> emphasis <clears throat> on the linkages to other questions of what type of economy, what type of democracy, what type of civil society, and finally also really what type of knowledges uh, how are we how are we validating knowledge and this that uh, uh, that Luciana mentioned <clears throat> really taking serious the agency that people themselves are expressing and departing from that i would say initially we had so many of these ideas but from my perspective i'm 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 probably much too pessimist I think the last couple of decades Kate's, has been one of uh, of uh, colonization of these type of um, of activities. Um, I think it is time to uh, to link much better to the multiple dimensions of crisis that we are that we are experiencing experiencing right now. To link much better to to the big issues of eco social transition. Uh, and, and to understand, you know, I've, I've been participating uh, for the European Union and with Amos in mapping of social enterprises in Europe, and it is based on some organizational characteristics. I think it is now very important to understand critically, to use this notion of ecosystem, to understand how crises are nourishing each other. It is not that it is not like one crisis is replacing the next one. These crises are actually feeding and fueling each other uh, to understand better these uh, in interconnections between the climate uh, crisis of climate change, biodiversity, inequality, and, and, and so on and so forth. We could mention at least 12 crises or so on. Um, <clears throat> so the fun fundamental thing about a critical social enterprise agenda today, I would argue, is to ask still this, this question in the first chapter of our book, social enterprise, is it possible to decolonize uh, this concept? And, and uh, Luciana gave some wonderful uh, examples on uh, a way forward here. Thank you. Thank you, Inas. Thank you so much. Again, if you want to make any comments, questions, you can use the chat, Zoom chat um, during the presentation. So uh, after after last, I will give the floor to Swati. She, 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 she's fine. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. And uh, thank you, friends and everyone here. Um, I would like to start with that. I think this book uh, by itself has been, uh, you know, an endeavor of uh, global friendship, global scholarship, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, a connect connection of the global south and the global north. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that itself uh, has created uh, newer understanding, newer conceptualization, and newer emergences of knowledges. And uh, I, I would feel that's a very, very interesting, exciting starting point, and we should have more of those exchanges. Um, having said that, uh, you know, taking on further, um, uh, so this book is also about, you know, what uh, Luciana has said, Lars, Lars has said, it's about, uh, you know, moving away from looking at uh, some of uh, these terms like social entrepreneurship, innovation, as magic bullets, as Spanish here, uh, to looking at it with a critical gaze, uh, to understanding, uh, you know, what we have said in the beginning, like, is it possible to decolonize the concept? How are we also looking at processes of advanced colonialism, uh, let's say, within the context of South, and how does it influence us? And therefore, how do we look at this cast of mind? Uh, which is influencing the way we look at and creating uh, imageries, uh, which uh, you know looks at some of these concepts in a particular manner. Within this context, let me come to this chapter on 
uh, grassroots social innovation and what are some of the key points that we have attempted to address in this. Um, what informs grassroots social innovation? So some of the points that we have uh, looked at in this is about uh, local people, uh, their diversities. Uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of times the concept of diversity is lost in the understanding of mainstream social innovation and the context of local space. How does how does that influence then? Uh, that's the second point, the dynamics of local participation and engagement, uh, which becomes a very important and essential point of uh, not only social innovation, but also this process of transformation. So here, essentially, we are looking at participation uh, within a complex space, uh, participation within a complex social structure, which is mediated by uh, uh, class, which is mediated by race, which is mediated by, for example, caste within the context of India. So how do we look at this mediated space of participation and within that, the power relations. So the starting point, therefore, uh, for social innovation uh, within grassroots innovations and alternative ideas is therefore people. And how do we also focus on people who are marginalized, people who are vulnerable? Uh, so we've tried to look at what Robert Chambers and many other theorists have also said, that we are trying to look at a paradigm of people, a paradigm of sustainability, moving away from what is called a paradigm, uh, which is more instrumental or a paradigm of things. And therefore, how does that inform uh, the processes of transformation, the creation of social value? And here we are talking about uh, the local knowledge. Um, here we are talking about new emergences that are emerging from the grassroots, newer ways of addressing things. Uh, so how do we you know, engage with this knowledge of people at the grassroots, engage with this knowledge of people who are marginalized? So here we are saying that ability to engage with knowledge itself is a means of empowerment because you know as Buventura de Souza Santos has also said it's about you know there has been and many post-development theorists that there has been a process of epistemicide and we are looking at now uh, new emergences epistemic diversity we are also talking about not only uh, you know epistemology we are also talking about axiology we are talking about you know what is it that we value and how do we value it you know, how do we look at people's knowledges? And therefore, uh, what this chapter tries to also delineate is about uh, people's democracy, grassroots democracy. How do we deconstruct the hegemony, deconstruct the mainstream narrative through direct engagement, through direct democracy, through innovation? So that's that's the core. And this chapter uh, also looks at some of the grassroots examples from India, uh, which is about women's collectives, farmers collectives, et cetera, and tries to look at, therefore, what are the drivers because of which people are coming together? And then the processes of transformation, pre looking at actor networks, et cetera. Uh, so the three points which is emerging out of this uh, you know, looking at some of the grassroots example is, uh, is the need for inclusion. And how do we look at a process of inclusion within a context of inequality, within a context of uh, structural hierarchy, et cetera? And what is emerging, which Luciana has also highlighted, how do we look at within this context, the emergence of agency of people, the emergence of agency of marginalized people. And what we are talking about in this chapter is what is called collective agency. So when we are looking at a power imbalance, a power hierarchy, a lot of times individual risk taking, individual uh, power wouldn't work. So then it's about collective power. It's about power with to address the power over. And collective agency becomes, therefore, a very, very important underlying point and a critique to the mainstream idea of social entrepreneurship, which is talking about the individual risk-taking behavior. So therefore, uh, you know, 
some of this inclusion collective agency and collective empowerment and action underlines uh, you know some of these processes and we are finally talking about that how do we uh, look at a process of transformation within what uh, Lars is also talking about within this multiple crisis that we are at present and how do we create a new democratic imaginary how do we look at uh, you know deinstitutionalization how do we look at processes of reinstitutionalization and within all of this how do we look at diversity how do we center stage pluralism how do we center stage uh, people their diversity uh, their marginalities and the whole uh, you know the sustainability so centeredness and people centeredness again forms an underlying understanding within the context of uh, this new imaginary of social enterprise through the participation of local people and understanding uh, the processes of inequities that mediates this thank you so much thank you so much swati <laughs> So again, if you want to make any comments during the presentation, use the chat, Zoom chat. Now I would give the floor to, uh, we give the floor to Flo. Avelino. Thank you very much. Uh, so I prepared some slides, which usually helps me to keep it short. Let's see if it does. Yeah, it should. Uh, can you see them? Perfectly, thank yeah. you. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. It was a real joy to be part of this project. Uh, so I was invited to this today specifically to present uh, chapter 10, uh, which is looking at the transformative potential of social enterprises from a multi-actor perspective. Lots of big words that I could spend hours talking about, which I'm not going to do. Um, uh, so what I want to do is share some of the kind of the, the two or three main kind of arguments, insights from, from this chapter. Uh, which are quite in line with what, what has been discussed so far. Uh, so the, the, the most important argument is that in order for social enterprises to contribute to transformative change, uh, we propose to look at transformative potential in the sense that uh, social enterprises can be transformative to the extent that they challenge, alter, and or replace the dominant structures and power relations that underlie the societal challenges that they're tackling. So if you take the example of people producing their own energy through an energy community initiative and energy cooperative, you could frame this as a social enterprise. It's technologically innovative, it's socially innovative, but we would argue it's only transformative to the extent that it truly really challenges the underlying energy system that is centralized fossil fuel based and utterly polluting, and then maybe even going deeper than that, also really challenging the underlying economic system of um, uh, hypercapitalism and overconsumption. Now, studying power relations is easier said than done, and there's many different ways of approaching power. And this chapter proposes the multi-actor perspective, which in the meantime, I have increasingly grown unsatisfied with, but we can discuss that later. Uh, but for now, I'll... Um, I'll, I'll share this, uh, this multi-actor perspective. Uh, so it's based on this distinction between different institutional logics. And then one of the arguments is that, you know, rather than putting organizations or individuals in these categories, it's about acknowledging that, you know, uh, the state is not just policymakers, but also us as citizens. And the market is also not just the big producers and the businesses, but also us as consumers. And the nonprofit sector is not just the Greenpeace activists, but also us as members, volunteers. And in the community, we play very different roles. So each and every one of us plays a role across all these different logics. And the argument is here that all these different roles can be entrepreneurial. So social entrepreneurship can occur in, across all these roles. Uh, so that then also leads to the different case studies that we looked at, not looking at the kind of more classical social enterprises from uh, social businesses in the market, as Philip also said, but also looking at things like uh, eco-villages or participatory budgeting, and emphasizing that in these initiatives, you see that the relations between these different institutional logics and the different roles that actors play um, that that these relations are shifting and that is inherent to social and enterprises that these relations and boundaries are are, are changing and shifting um, and that also comes with all sorts of changing power relations and power dynamics 
Uh, and then on the one hand, we can talk about the kind of the big macro um, level power uh, dynamics between, you know, the, the state logic, the market logic and the community logic and the nonprofit logic, where we clearly see that there is a, a hegemony of this kind of formalized um, uh, welfare state kind of public private partnership, particularly the market logic. Uh, but there is also more micro-political power dynamics going on when we zoom into these institutional logics. It's not just about state versus the market, but you also have like international government or national government versus more local government or, you know, elected politicians versus civil servants. And in the market, of course, which is very important for social entrepreneurship, big business versus smaller business. But then also in the other institutional logics, there is a lot of, of course, power inequalities uh, between genders, ethnicities, and generations, uh, and so on. Um, and here, the main argument from our chapter is that when we want to evaluate and talk about the transformative potential of social enterprises, if we define uh, transformative potential in terms of the extent to which existing power relations are being uh, challenged and or reproduced, we need to distinguish between these different levels. And on the one hand, this can lead to critical appraisal where we say, okay, even if the social enterprises manages to challenge power relations at the micro level, it might at the same time still reproduce the existing power relations at the macro level. But unfortunately, it also works the other way around. So even if we could argue that a social enterprise is really challenging, you know, uh, market hege hegemony, for instance, um, then, then still it can have unintended, often unintended implications in terms of reproducing power relations more at the micro level. Just to end with this example of uh, renewable energy and decentralized energy production, it's very easy to imagine how that will shift power from big companies and, and centralized government to community initiatives. Uh, so there, there is a potential to challenge these macro level power relations. But then when we look at these happy pictures of community energy initiatives, it's equally important to ask who is not on this picture and why, and what kind of new forms of exclusion um, are, are being reproduced, uh, either intended or unintendedly. But then not end there, which is a tendency that power analysis has to end there and become cynical about these initiatives, but then to really actively look at interesting initiatives where you see entrepreneurial initiatives collaborating with local governments, for instance, to see how these social entrepreneurial um, initiatives can be connected to, to public investment. So for instance, in this case where uh, renewable energy um, initiatives where the profits of those were not just reinvested in the community initiatives, but also at the, uh, at the municipal level to see how to deal with energy pro pro uh, poverty at the level of municipalities. Um, and I would like to keep it there, to keep it short and give us some time for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flor. Thank you, it was very concise. And thank you. And so the last presentation would be the one of Jean-Louis. Jean-Louis, I give you the floor. If you want to conclude this session before the debate. Hello, uh, happy to see you uh, again. Um, I just want to introduce by finishing the presentation to introduce the debate. Uh, I think that what was said by the colleagues is that through this exploratory research, we are arguing for a real debate uh, inside MS also, because uh, I think we cannot reduce our work to uh, typologies of social enterprise. Uh, I think we are in another context. Uh, we are faced to a very dogmatic and dangerous project for humanity, uh, which is neoliberalism. And this neoliberalism, which has global consequences, has integrated the discourse of social enterprise in a kind of second generation neoliberalism, which is uh, full of paternalistic and philanthropic uh, arguments. And I think that we have to consider in which context uh, uh, social enterprise is now used. And, and I think that it's uh, uh, important to have this discussion if we want to be collectively responsible in, uh, uh, in an arena like MS, 
Uh, and if we want really to be uh, responsible for eco and solidarity transitions. I think that there is a huge project here inside the demo dogmatic one to instrumentalize uh, social enterprise to provide uh, a new colonialism, uh, a new managerial isomorphism. And I think that uh, it's important to have a, a debate about it, uh, I think. And this debate, how uh, uh, it was said by my friends and colleagues uh, strongly, uh, I think that for this, we need to uh, join again with a critical theory. Uh, I think that we have uh, to uh, recover this critical perspective, but this critical perspective has also to be renewed. Uh, and I think of uh, recent books uh, published about how to decolonize critical theory, uh, which are important, I think, to, to integrate. Uh, we first uh, try to argue, I summarize very quickly, but that uh, social enterprise are not only private collective enterprise. They have a public dimension, it was uh, said again. And of course, these public spaces uh, we have with Nancy Fraser, uh, the, the idea that uh, public spaces have to be open for uh, sub, uh, subaltern counter publics, but it stays in the framework of social movements. And I think what is important with some currents uh, of the South, uh, epistemologies of the South, as we said, is that uh, they insist on the fact that public spaces accessible to uh, counter publics are not only social movement in the traditional form, but they are also linked with socioeconomic uh, daily questions. Uh, and I think that uh, this link between a socioeconomic uh, field and public dimension is uh, when a point which was uh, important in her collective approach. And the second one also is how we do research now. Uh, and I uh, continue what uh, Swati just said. I think that it's also, and it has to be uh, integrated in the, uh, in the research about social enterprise, how we do research about social enterprise, uh, how we are, we are in a, also in a perspective where we try to stimulate cross-cutting between different types of knowledges. And probably it's also a way to renew critical theory, not to think that critical theory is only coming from academic knowledge, but it's coming from a mix between academic knowledge, experiential knowledge, and professional knowledge. And I think that these uh, questions were just approached in the book, but I think they have, they have to be raised again uh, because we are in a context, as it was said by all my colleagues, which is really a, a difficult context and we cannot continue in a functionalist research about uh, social enterprise. We have really to uh, question the notion itself of social enterprise. Thank you, John Louis. Thank you all for this uh, different presentation that gave a full part of the landscape of the, of the book. Now it's time for questions. If you want to use the chat or take the floor for commenting, asking questions and so on. Any question, any remarks, comments? Yeah, I, I was trying to open the debate and it's just a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? I might. I would like to start. That's Go okay. So is your. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I I thought it was quite inspiring your last 
um, invitation to discussion <laughs> about uh, rejoining, but also decolonizing uh, critical theory. Uh, and by that stream of thought, I thought it, I've been wondering if any of you have kind of uh, followed the path of critical theory traveling the world, like perhaps probably coming from the continent of Europe, but then traveling, traveling to Latin America, being transformed in the 60s, 70s in various ways, then traveling back to Europe and how that has informed various cooperative initiatives and so on and so forth. So is there something there to like broaden our understanding of and also conceptualization of what we mean by epistemologies of the South? Are they only of the South? Um, and if we want to rejoin critical theory, in what in what version of critical theory is it? Only the the version of white European men, or is it also in adapted versions uh, of other people later on? Does that make sense? Okay, maybe Lucian can answer. Uh, well. Uh... I, I think that's a very good question. Uh, to what extent are we prepared to invite uh, um, adaptations of critical critical theory in other contexts to to be to be on the table also? Uh, but but I think that the 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 question uh proposed by Jean-Louis regarding uh revisiting critical theory is is very is very nice because uh for some groups it's not possible to think of epistemologies of the south uh because it does not make sense for some groups uh, the very idea of the South and the very idea of the North, I have I have seen many contests about about that, uh, and uh, I think that revisiting uh, critical theory through other lenses uh, could help us. To, to forge alliances, new alliances, you know what I mean? Because uh, if I stay with epistemologists of the South, with no conversation with other <laughs> theoretical paradigms that have uh, addressed uh, critical important issues along the time, I think that we'll be uh, alone, talking alone, so I think it's very important to requalify to a certain extent what we have called as critical critical theory. Yeah. And uh, the time has come to for for this theory to be uh, to be fed, to be stimulated, to be challenged by other perspectives. Uh, that haven't been uh, totally known in the North because they were addressed in the South. For example, the way Marxism has been, has been uh, constituted a political, a pivotal political frame in Latin America. It's totally different from the European perspective of uh, critical thought. So uh but but i think that there is a problem and the problem is what lars said at the beginning uh to what extent are we ready to uh to reframe our main discussions mm. on democracy on what is to be considered as epistemology on what is uh, development, if these ideas were not a challenge, it uh, it will be difficult for us to to move on, as Jean Louis said, I think, because this idea of 
abandoning the functionalist way of doing things is something very urgent. But uh, the fact is that we we have seen, and I think it's problematic uh, to say that, but we have seen all the apparatus reproducing the same ideas uh, and the way some key words are addressed, social inclusion, as I mentioned before, uh, development, uh, they, they are all contaminated by an idea of uh, symbolic inequality mm -hmm. from the very beginning. And this, I, th that's why I think that it's so important, as, said, as what she said, to foster new imageries. We need the new imageries uh, in all areas. And social enterprise is not an exception. We need a new uh, perspectives, theoretical and empirical perspectives, for example, uh, to evaluate the results we have had. The results that the projects, European projects, have challenged us to have because the guidelines uh, that allow us to evaluate what is successful or not or less successful is contaminated from the very beginning. So that's the point. How, as Lars said and as Jean-Louis said, how can we uh, foster how can we research differently uh, the issue of social enterprise when all the apparatus is uh, departing from the same perspective? That is the idea that the Western solutions are the best ones. Even when you are uh, bringing the difference to be with you, but this participation is not equal. The conditions of negotiating meanings is not the same. So that's that's the, the problem, I think. Thank you, Risa. Not an answer, just uh, another question, how to do it. There is another question for Katia. I see that Lars, Jean-Louis, you would like to take the floor. I will Lars first. Yeah, just uh, very briefly. Uh, about elements of a, of a critical theory. I think when Swati uh, is, um, is mapping Dalit villages and mapping competences of Dalit women, it is part of a, a new critical theory, a, a really a, a core part of it, uh, because it connects to what Luciana talked about, be sure to support what people themselves understand as agencies, really to try to to go into people's own knowledges and own own agencies is such a is such a theory, new critical theory. Is it Marxist? I don't know. Probably it's uh, to some extent Marxist, but from my perspective, uh, uh, classical European Marxists have been rather have, have had rather big difficulties in listening to other other socialist thinkers than Marxists. So it has been a kind of tautology. Been, been have, have had difficulties actually to under to to accept, validate, uh, support people's self organization, uh, leading uh, leading to to other uh, other uh, types of agency, leading to other types of organizations than those uh, prescribed by 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 classical Marxist thinking. Thank you, Lars. Shall we? Yeah, just to continue one second, and I don't think that we can finish this discussion today, but uh, uh, I uh, really agree with the position we were written also by Flor and some of these his co our colleagues about critical theory. I think that we have an heritage from the Eurocentric uh, critical theory, which is important. Uh, it's the part we can call deconstructive, uh, because uh, th from the Frankfurt School, we uh, see that reason can be a new myth that 
there is a link between uh, social domination and domination of nature. So these points are very important. But this Eurocentric critical theory is not uh, sufficient for the second step, which is a reconstructive one. And I think that in this, we can learn a lot from epistemologies of the South, because there are not only dominations, alienations, reifications, there are also absences. And these absences, this uh, uh, imaginary, to uh, continue with what you said, uh, was also making invisible some parts of the world. And, and uh, I think that this epistemology, which links the recognition of absences with the recognition of emergences, can be linked very clearly to the field of social enterprise. So I, I think that we have to uh, link in a, in a new way. And we, of course, we it's a huge discussion between this deconstructive part, which is deconstructed the old imaginary and the dominant imaginary, as you said, and to reconstruct with practice and with self-reflection with the actors, uh, some elements of a reconstructive critique also, which is quite important, just to uh, keep the way of emancipation and not to be only uh, in the denunciation of dominations. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Uh, Flo, you want to... You have raised your hand. Maybe there is also a question from Katya. I don't know if you have an idea about EU policy, about social <laughs> Well, I'll, I can try to say something about it, but I just wanted to confirm what was said so far, and that um, this discussion is not only going on in social enterprises and critical theory, but you have the similar discussions when it comes to the field of transitions yeah. to sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability, um, and also power theory. So. I always feel a bit humble chipping in on this discussion because I've been very much part of reproducing this kind of uh, reliance on European political theory. Uh, so ironically, power theory, <laughs> um, uh, some of the most classical power theories are typically very you know, Eurocentric, the ones that I have built on at least. And just to give you an example, there's this famous typology of power to over with. Uh, and at some point, uh, there was a very interesting speaker that I invited who introduced power within, and I was completely inspired. And I think uh, Swati and Luciano also uh, already mentioned that concept by it. And I asked, okay, can you give me the references of this concept? I want? And then it was a completely different field than I'm usually uh, used to work on. It was like more feminist theory and also non-academic non sources. And it kind of challenges your whole way of working. You're like, but can I can I use these uh, references in, in the journals that I'm used to publish? So it really challenges the way we think. And that's the most challenging. And also for me, for instance, I mean, I speak Portuguese. I should not have any excuse to only read Anglo-Saxon <laughs> publications. I should read Portuguese literature, but it, I've never done this. So it completely challenges the, the way we're used to work as academics. And I think that's... So when it comes to decolon decolonizing, this is one of the main challenges, I think, to really also work and think differently in how we do research, as Jean-Louis also um, emphasized. And then just for the European thing, the hope I have is that you now have this, this emerging interest for justice, just sustainability transitions. And I think also at the European level, I think all the co-optation of social innovation, of transitions, I think we can challenge that by getting in insights from justice. And there is a there is interest from the European level for that. And there is also a commitment, you know, the green transition, leaving no one behind. What does that mean? You know, scholars from all over the world have been thinking about what that means so we can learn from them. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll stop my rant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this comment, Flo. Any other comment or question? Thank you, Noriko, for your comment in the chat. You want to say something, Noriko? Um, 
not particularly because it's just a very small comment, but as the discussion has been uh, cent centered in the European, non European world. So, as we have other people from other continents, so just I like to share my feeling in these years. And each time I find more um, closer the um, social problems that we are sharing in the world between Latin America and in, in Japanese or other societies. So, but um, the social movement or challenge of the people are more visible and more recognized in Latin America countries. And here in Japan, I think some people are now looking at alternative and also they are uh, questioning the, the, the mainstream framework, but the voice is not so, uh, how to say hard, like Latin American countries. So I think we have more to learn from other continents. I agree. Thank you so much, Dorinko. It was nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah. So the, since there, if there is no other questions, time is over. It was a, a great pleasure to meet you and to have, uh, again, this uh, debate with you all and uh, the editors and authors of the book.